Hey everyone, I'm Nito King, and welcome to the first episode of Uncontrolled, the unofficial, unauthorized, and thoroughly unenlightening podcast where I talk about topics that are related to the game Control. Stuff that I can't really talk about during the gameplay videos because there's too much of it. But I also can't be bothered to come up with any good visual aids, and that would make this take so much longer than it already did. I think I intended to make this video something like a year ago, and I'm only just getting around to it. So this is about as much effort as I'm willing to put in. If you're just looking to get back to more gameplay, and you're watching this playlist sometime in the future, just go ahead and hit the next video button. I don't think you're going to miss all that much. In fact, part of the problem is, I had way too much to say for this first episode, so I've decided to split it into two. We've seen a lot of paperwork in the research sector so far, and a lot of it has to do with Dr. Ash, the former head of the research division. So he has a bunch of ideas about what goes into causing all of the paranormal phenomena that the Bureau is investigating, and we've gotten a lot of contrast between him and Dr. Darling. Dr. Darling seems to feel that resonance is behind everything. And you can't really shoot down that theory because we're surrounded with the effects of resonance. We're dealing with an invasion of a hostile resonance, and the only defense that we have is a good resonance. We don't quite know what the source of it is yet, but the HRAs are pretty much proof that his ideas are right. But Dr. Ash was more into synchronicity, the collective unconscious, groupthink. So, in this episode, I want to look more into the idea of synchronicity. And next time, I want to talk more about groupthink, Ash's conformity experiment, not the same Ash. Theodore Ash is the fictional Dr. Ash, who was the former head of research. Solomon Ash is a real-life doctor who did an actual experiment in conformity. But this time around, synchronicity. What the hell is it? Well, it's an idea that came from the early 20th century philosopher and psychologist Carl Jung, or at least that's the name I always see attached to it, and he was mentioned in some of the documents in this video game. Synchronicity, as best I can tell, and I'll point out right now, I haven't actually studied any of this stuff. This is all just information that I found online and my own common sense talking here. But synchronicity seems to be kind of an alternative cause and effect. We're all familiar with the way cause and effect actually works. You know, event A happens, and then due to physical processes, Newtonian laws, perhaps chemical reactions, atomic physics, that causes event B to happen in a predictable way. And then event B will similarly cause a change of state in the universe that causes event C to happen. And so on. But sometimes something happens and we look at the situation and say, you know, it would be really neat if this happened as a result of that. Even though there's no scientific basis for it whatsoever. Or in the alternative, we might say, it would really suck if this happened. So, of course, it's going to. Murphy's Law. That's about the most scientific we get here. Synchronicity is a cause and effect based on what we, as human observers, feel should happen. And that forms the basis for this alternative causality. This is stuff like superstition, dramatic irony, Chekhov's gun, the idea that a prop that's prominently featured in Act 1 of a story has to play an important role in Act 3. There's no reason for that. That's just the way fiction works. Synchronicity kind of applies that to real life. This is the idea that on the day that you wash your car, the Earth's gravity changes so that every clump of mud or bird poop in the area gravitates to your car. Or the day that you're wearing the clothes you just washed, or paid for expensive dry cleaning, 
your finger muscles somehow fail every time you carry something that can spill. Or the day that you wash the kitchen floor is exactly the day when it rains and your kids will track mud all over it. There's no actual relationship between any of these things, but we form that association in our minds, and synchronicity says, yeah, that connection is actually relevant. It's a real thing that's actually causally happening in the universe. I recognize that I'm grossly oversimplifying this, so let's take a look at the example that's actually in the game. Dr. Ash performed a synchronicity experiment where he had 50 people around the world set up 50 rooms to look identical. And then simultaneously in 49 of those rooms, they changed the TV channel. The idea was that synchronicity should cause the channel and the TV in the 50th room to change, even though nothing in the physical universe had caused it to do that. Why would that happen? Well, because all those rooms are identical. And now, they're all identical except for the channel that's on the TV. Anybody looking at all 50 of those rooms would think it was kind of weird that somebody had gone to such meticulous detail in every other part of the room and somehow overlooked what channel that TV was tuned to. Because they should all be the same. And it's kind of a, what's the simplest explanation here? It seems easier to explain a TV channel spontaneously changing for no reason than it would be to explain why all these rooms are identical except for that one detail. That's the thing that kind of leads you to think, maybe there's greater forces at work. Something that we can't understand has made one room slightly different. In other words, it kind of shifts the cause of the TV channel changing from, you know, somebody hitting a button on a remote to it being a copy of this room that we've made in so many other places. Every other place where the room looks like that, the TV has changed channel. So why didn't it change in this one case? That's weird. Another thought experiment that might make it a bit clearer. Suppose that you were to make a room and set it up with ten tables and put five identical potted plants on each table. Fifty plants total no discernible difference between any of them. You set up the room so that the light is uniform throughout, you set up a sprinkler system so every plant gets the same amount of water, except you never actually turn the sprinkler system on. Instead, you just take a watering can into the room and very carefully water 49 of the plants. The 50th plant never gets any water. Now, nobody expects the power of synchronicity to keep the plant alive when it doesn't get any water. That's just silly. The plant is going to die. But now, you set up some cameras in the room, film it from all sorts of different angles, but very carefully don't include the dead plant in any of those views. You make it clear that there are ten tables, that there are five plants on each table. You get the pot of the dead plant in some of those views, but not the plant itself. Now you bring in someone who hasn't seen the experiment, doesn't know what it is that you've done in this room, you show them the camera feeds and say, I'd like you to tell me how many identical potted plants there are in this room. An enterprising person is probably going to count 10 tables, five plots per table, multiply them together and say, there are 50 identical plants in this room. That's the reasonable assumption to make. They're missing the information that one of the plants is not identical to the rest. And why would they fill in that information? Why would they even suspect that the one plant they can't see clearly? If they can even work out that there is one plant they can't see clearly, why would they assume that to be any different than all the other ones? There's a phenomenon called apophenia which is the human tendency to notice patterns, whether they're actually there or not, and use them to make logical deductions. 
So in this case, we see an array of identical plants. Without any specific evidence to the contrary, we're going to assume that any plants that we can't actually see are the same as the ones around them, because that's the simplest thing to fill in the gap with. We see a bunch of identical plants, it's reasonable to assume that all the plants are identical. It's only if the person is suspicious of why we're asking this question that they might start to read something else into it. And even then, the likelihood that the assumption they make about what information they don't have and the actual value of what we're hiding from them is remote. There's one easy answer and tons of subtle answers, only one of which can be correct. Apophenia is at the heart of a lot of human thought. In my mind, it covers everything from the basis of most religions, all the way down to internet blogs like Faces and Things, which shows us that any time you have two similar objects next to each other and then one or two below them that look like an eye, you know, a nose and or a mouth, it looks like a face. And once you see the face, you can even determine what emotion that face would be feeling, even though that's not actually a face, and it's probably on something that's not capable of feeling emotion. We just see the shape of something that resembles a face, and we say, ah, it looks like a face. And if it were a face, it would be this kind of face showing this kind of expression. Apophenia leads us to all sorts of conclusions that aren't necessarily right. It's not a bad thing. It's actually kind of a survival instinct. You know, if you see three people get sick after eating berries from a certain bush, the survival instinct would be to conclude that all the berries on that bush would probably make me sick if I eat them. Whereas the only evidence you have is that three people got sick, and also they all ate berries from the same plant. But there are a lot of other berries. Maybe it was just those three specific berries. Maybe all the other berries on the bush are fine, or maybe they all got sick for unrelated reasons. You don't know, but drawing the proper inference gives you a better survival chance. The problem is that that leads us to connect all sorts of things that don't actually have a connection. And the degree to which we believe them can vary as well. You know, this is the root of superstition. People saying things like, well, my team is going to win because I'm wearing my lucky jersey. The clothing you're wearing is highly unlikely to have any actual impact on the performance of a sports team, unless you are a player on that team, in which case wearing clothing that gives you confidence can improve the quality of your play, whereas if you aren't wearing that particular article of clothing, you might have performance anxiety and play poorly even though the clothing doesn't really affect your play in any specific way. The psychological impact of it is important. But for players versus fans at home, nobody on the team even knows what you're wearing. And don't forget, there are probably people who are fans of the other team also wearing lucky jerseys. There's no actual connection there, but Synchronicity, I believe, is trying to tell us that no, there actually is a connection, it's just not something that we can measure or use for any predictive quality. Even in Control, the experiment that they ran with the 50 TVs didn't result in synchronicity. The 50th TV didn't change channel. The only thing that actually carried over was the mental state of the people who were preparing those rooms. When it comes to mental state, there is actually some possibility of information being transferred in this way. A core tenet of pretty much all of Jung's ideas that I've been reading about is the idea that you can be influenced by something without actually directly experiencing it. In the case of synchronicity, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but there's also this idea of the collective unconscious, which is a sum of all human knowledge or at least some core human knowledge, that rather than being something that any individual human experiences, it's just part of the definition of being human. It's in our DNA. And there's some precedent for that. We know about instinct. Knowledge that 
members of certain species are just born with. Sea turtles don't have to learn when you're born, go to the sea, and here's how to do it. They just come out of the eggs and they do it. And if that's not stored in the DNA, then where is it? I know there are actual theories about that, but from a natural selection standpoint, it makes sense. The sea turtles that have get to the sea, here's how to do it, in their DNA are more likely to survive and have children that will carry the same thing in their DNA. The ones that don't do that aren't going to make it to the sea, they're not going to survive. And there's something more fundamental to it than that. Jung talks about archetypes, you know, the basic building blocks of personality, as something that's just fundamentally inherent to humanity. The idea of certain aspects of our personality being defined through basic humanity and not shaped by outside influences. More like shaped by inside influences that are not part of our experience. Or perhaps just a means of passing information from one person to another without information actually exchanging hands, so to speak. The idea that some things are just so fundamental to our experience that everybody knows them. And granted, Jung was almost a hundred years before the internet existed. But I think internet meme culture kind of takes this idea to an extreme. There are some things that everybody knows, even if they haven't directly experienced it. There are movies that everybody can quote from, even if they've never seen the movie, just because the information is so pervasive. It's like it is part of our DNA, rather than being something that we experienced somewhere. If you've played Nine Hours, Nine Persons, Nine Doors, you might know that idea better as the morphogenetic field. And in that game, they actually talked about an experiment that I'm pretty sure didn't actually happen. But for all I know, maybe it did. Where they showed a bunch of people a picture that was kind of an abstract representation of something. A lot of people didn't recognize what it was supposed to be. And they only showed that segment on a TV show that reached a couple hundred people. But when they repeated the experiment years later, almost everybody recognized what the picture was supposed to be, whereas the percentage of people that recognized the separate control picture that they didn't show the answer for on TV was about the same between the two studies, suggesting that the information had much wider reach than what the TV program had, even though there was no reason for people to talk about it. It was just that because somebody in the world had experienced that information, it entered this collective space, this morphogenetic field, the collective unconscious. So everybody else who saw that picture had a chance of being able to pull that information out of the collective unconscious and be aware of it without ever having actually received the information directly. My thinking is, that's all pseudoscience. There's a good explanation for all of it. And in particular, it is unconscious, or at least subconscious. But we experience a lot more than we're actually aware of experiencing. And again, with the rise of TV, and then the subsequent rise of the internet, the whole wealth of human information is just that pervasive. We do take in a lot of information that we don't recognize at the time. We don't directly, consciously process it, but it still gets into our brain. It still kind of seeps into the cracks as such, and it's still there. So if we're trying to come up with a new piece of information, that information is more likely to come up than any random fabrication you could care to imagine. And I think probably the best way to illustrate that is to talk about the Mandela Effect. This is a psychological phenomenon that seems to have become more popular lately, again, thanks to the spread of information, where you discover that a piece of information that you have always believed to be true was actually never true. The famous example that immediately comes to mind is the spelling of Stan and Jan Berenstain, the authors of the Berenstain Bears books, where 
most people seem to think that their name is spelled with an E, you know, S-T-E-I-N, the way that you spell names that end in Steen or Stein. And then everybody sees an actual book or article or, you know, sees their name written somewhere, and no, that's S-T-A-I-N. And they go, well, I swear it's not like that. That's not the way their name is spelled. And I remember reading those books as a kid. But you go looking for any proof of the idea that you originally remembered, and it's not there. As far as you can tell, everything in the universe has always indicated that it's not what you thought it was. And it can kind of feel like you've slipped into an alternate dimension. Because you swear this is the way it was as a kid, but now... Marty McFly has shown up, and everything has suddenly changed around you, and you're the only one who remembers it. Well, you and a couple thousand other people who also mysteriously seem to have the same false memory. I'm pretty sure this all just comes down to the way our memory works. Memory is read-once storage. So when you remember something, you forget it. Normally, especially if you're thinking about computers, read once memory isn't a problem, because once you've read it, you just have to write the same thing back to where it was stored before, and no harm, no foul. It'll be there the next time you want to read it. But when it comes to the human brain, we're thinking about more things than just that. And when we recall a memory, it gets kind of jumbled up with whatever other things we may happen to be thinking of at the time. And especially if we have contradictory information in front of us, that will affect the memory that we're pulling out and then storing back again. There are ways to use this positively. I was recently experimenting with a psychological treatment known as EMDR, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, which actively causes you to recall a memory, and process it with your conscious mind while the subconscious is kind of holding it in a state of emotional flux. So you're remembering it and you're actively thinking about it at the same time in a guided fashion. So hopefully you can take some of the more positive aspects of your current thought process, apply them to the emotional state associated with that memory, and then put it back into your subconscious in a better light. The Mandela Effect is kind of a less beneficial version of that, where if you see somebody make a particular mistake or state a false fact, especially in the realm of, I thought it was like this, you pull up the memory to check it, and it gets conflated with the false information you've been given. And, you know, in the case of Stain versus Stein, Every other name that you've seen in your recent experience, which has probably been spelled Stein, and you think, yeah, that's the way that I remember it. And then it goes back into your mind and just keeps holding that false value. Except now you're convinced that that was always the way that it was. Brains are weird. And I think the same kind of thing is probably responsible for people with ADHD forgetting things that they've just been told. Because again, you pull up that memory, and then you have to write it back to where it came from. Well, if my brain, in the process of pulling up that memory, gets yanked off in some other direction, and I'm not thinking about that thing anymore, it might not even be written back into my brain. The memory might just disappear completely. And the harder I try to remember it, the more chances there are for that to happen. Some task switch just zapping the information out of existence. Which is why I have to keep writing things down. But effects like that can make you feel like you're in some surreal copy of what used to be the real world. Which is a perfect feeling for control. Yes, I'm getting back on topic now after all this time. I do kind of want to talk about surreality, but not in this episode. I want to save that. Because I do want to talk about the fact that I am talking about a video game in this context. And the idea of synchronicity, the collective unconscious, dramatic irony, that sort of stuff. Because I think at this point I may actually 
possibly have an original idea, not just something that I'm making up based on what information I bothered to look up before starting this thing. Because I was writing a story recently where a couple of characters were talking about destiny, fate, the idea that you know some greater power out there might have control over our lives and dictate what happens to us, what doesn't happen to us, what happens as a result of our actions, and the idea that you know something bad happens, but something good eventually comes out of it, and you might say, oh, well, you know, I was lucky. Fate was kind to me because, you know, if my house hadn't burned down, I wouldn't have moved to this place where I found a much better job. Or, you know, if I hadn't been fired, I wouldn't have taken this other opportunity, which has made my life so much better. And the conclusion that the characters came to, you know, particularly the character who was expressing my viewpoint on the thing, said, well, there's no such thing as fate. That's basically, you just want to make the best situation for yourself. And when something bad happens, you're in the moment, you're going to look for what is my best path forward. And if you do get to a better point, which you usually do, then you're going to look back and say, yeah, I wouldn't have gotten to this point if not for that negative thing that happened in the past. And then we call that fate. So there is nothing driving everything that happens to us. No conscious being out there deciding what's going to happen to us in the future. And then I realized that that's wrong. It's wrong because these are fictional characters in a story that I'm writing, saying that there isn't some higher power controlling their lives. When there is a higher power controlling their lives, and it's me, the guy writing the story, the guy deciding what happens and what doesn't, and what the character's actions are going to lead to, and even what actions they're going to take, they have no free will because I'm writing them. All the stuff that I mentioned about synchronicity... The, the dramatic irony, the Chekhov's gun principle, you know, the idea that the clues to solve a mystery are always going to be there in the story and the detective will always notice them and always determine the significance of them and always find the right answer to the mystery. All that stuff that doesn't apply in real life does apply in fiction. Every atheist in fiction is wrong. Because there is a god, and it's the person writing the story. The moment you take the conversation about real-world concepts like destiny, fate, and god, and discuss them inside a fictional context, the discussion completely changes. I brought this up to a friend and pointed out that if I were to write two characters having the same conversation that we were having, it's a different conversation just because they're being controlled by something that I, the author, can observe just by looking in a mirror. In our lives, we can't really say that for certain. The framework that we're in doesn't allow us to know. If we are actually just characters in a story that someone else is writing, and we'll never get to meet the author. I think it would be kind of interesting at some point to maybe write a story where one of the religions featured in the story is people who believe, with all their hearts, that they are characters in a story, and they worship the author. But I'm not about to subscribe to that belief myself just yet. Anyway... That's the basics of synchronicity. Again, from my perspective, I encourage you, if you want to actually learn anything about synchronicity, you should probably do your own research. I don't know if I can recommend reading any of Jung's books, from what I've heard, but they'd be a better source of information than me. And we will be hearing something of Dr. Darling's take on the whole synchronicity issue. And in fact, we have already seen a tiny bit of that I believe in the containment sector, we did hear Trench talking a bit about how altered items are created because we put items on altars. And that same idea is going to come up again in a Dr. Darling presentation significantly later in the game. So I'll try to remember to point that out when we get to it, just in case anybody has actually bothered to listen to this whole thing and will be watching for it. But that's all for this time. Next time, I'll be talking about groupthink and the conformity experiment. See you then!